We are Fandom Roulette. Two nerds with a passion for history, video games, tabletop games, and, well, really any nerdy stuff that comes into our lives. While we might not be able to name every ship classification in Star Wars, or every Pokemon, or every spell in the player's handbook, well, one of us can. We're still here to have a good time. Hey everyone, welcome to Phantom Roulette. This is Joe. And I'm Cody. And on Phantom Roulette, we talk about a myriad of nerdy things, including history, video games, tabletop RPGs, and whatever nerdy stuff we've been up to as of late. So, Cody, uh, what nerdy things have you been up to, my friend? Nerdy stuff? Well, yeah. I'll be talking about one of them in the video, in the game, video section. game section. Yeah. Did you like how I did that thing? Uh huh. And then <laughs> beyond that, just prepping for prepping for D and D, and I re well, I I rewatched the ending of Marvel's Infinity War to kind of remind myself how it all ended up. Yeah. Which was not right super it. great. No, it's not a it's not a fun one. I mean, it was a downer. Not that it was bad. I actually think those are like my favorite bits of that movie. Oh, for sure, it's very effective. I think yeah, it's about super it. tense, super dramatic, but uh, alas, yeah, just to, just that to see is who all they like, chose. Right, like, that too. So, what nerdy stuff have you been up to? Um, I a couple of things. I I started reading um the unbeatable Squirrel Girl run from a couple of years ago. Okay. Okay. Um, which has been very entertaining. Um, I I found out from my friend who suggested it to me that uh it was um written by the guys the the guy who did remember those comics where it was like two dinosaurs about to crush some houses. That sounds like a badass comic that I have never heard of. It's it was like a web comic where it was like two dinosaurs and it was like always the same four panels and the dialogue changed every time. And they're just like a red t-rex and an orange or like a green t-rex and an orange t-rex i'll i'll link you to some um this guy was the guy who was writing it so it's a uh, you know it, it it has its very tongue-in-cheek moments like one of the things is um she carries around deadpool's uh trading cards of supervillains so she can r- like remind herself what each supervillain's deal is um <laughs> i yeah, like it which is pretty entertaining um and yeah, uh, I was watching some later Marvel stuff as well to get ready because this weekend coming up is a cr- a crazy weekend. Yeah, it's like literally the end of a cinematic era, which is isn't crazy that weird? Mm hmm. Gosh. Yeah. So, um, uh, what twenty two films? Yeah. A television program. Oh yeah, that's right. Two. Technically, two. two television programs. Yeah, because there was Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and Agent Carter. Agent Carter. Yeah. Um, mini movies that not everyone has seen that were like on DVDs that are now no longer a thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they were they were entertaining. Uh, the one I would definitely recommend everyone look up uh, is there was one that bridged the gap between Iron Man 3 and potentially Iron Man 4. Um. Do you remember? Do you remember the twist of Iron Man three? Um, if memory serves, Iron Man three was the one where he was getting sick from his uh, chest implant, right? That was two. Three was the one with the Mandarin. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I, that, I tend to no, blur no, 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 no. I blur it's, the entire Iron Man thing into one like big blob. It's that. That's fair. Yeah, um, that's the so, one with like the cool like there were like twenty goddamn Iron Mans all kicking ass at the end. Yes, that that stuff was rad. And you know, um, they they changed the Mandarin so it was like a guy who was like a paid actor who was portraying the Mandarin, and it was Ben Kingsley. And then, um, let's just put it this way: he's in a prison cell, and uh, at the end, perhaps the real Mandarin shows up, and he's not too happy that someone is mimicking him. Um, which was kind of cool. Huh, that's weird. I so wait, so the so there was the paid actor Mandarin. Yeah. And then there was the guy who hired him to be the Mandarin, who was that if memory serves, he was kind of the who was he? 
he was another evil industrialist. Yeah, like he was basically the villain from Iron Man 1, but younger and blonde hair. Yeah, he was actually, weirdly enough, kind of a combination of the villains in 1 and 2. And he developed this this stuff called Extremis. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like like rage rage juice that you inhaled mm-hmm. or whatever. Cuz yeah. didn't uh didn't pots like inhale some? Yep. And like kick some ass for like a hot second and then yeah, like and became then he, like, a plot point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and then yeah, and so in the first movie, remember how there's like you know how he gets like kidnapped in Afghanistan? Yes, yes. Um, so there was like apparently like a one off shot where like one of the dudes in that organization had a tattoo that was like looked very similar to like the Seven Rings, which is like a terrorist organization that the Mandarin is like the leader of. Okay, okay. So people were like, oh, or is it like setting up the Mandarin or is it just, you know, like a, a little Easter eggy continuity thing? Uh, because, you know, no one knew that uh, in a decade and 22 films later, there was going to be a sprawling cinematic universe like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's when people were still asking questions like, oh, is that just like a cute little nod? It was like, mm, no, <laughs> we've been playing these bad boys. But anyway, uh, Cody, that brings us to a, 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 a new segment that I pitched very shortly ago. Yeah. Like, do, 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 do. Fan Theory Corner. <gasps> so in Fan Theory Corner, we propose fan theories um, that we think might happen during the film, uh, the films that we're excited about. And then, who knows, maybe Cody will go in and edit them so he sounds really smart and cuts out the ones that didn't happen. And he'll leave in <laughs> all of Joe's. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to so- do some real gnarly post uh post edits well no i'll edit this one right before i see endgame so i can't even i'm i'm joking i can't even so do you have any uh do you have any hot fan theories about uh what's gonna happen in endgame so my per and and uh jess and i my wife uh we're talking about this and she has a really good theory okay that is a little wilder and I'm not sure if at this point Marvel is comfortable doing this. Okay. Um, she thinks, um, so in Ant-Man and the Wasp, um, there were a couple of moments where they talk about time travel and like that world between, you know, the world between molecules and all that shit. Yeah. And, um, She is convinced that Ant-Man is going to either develop or accidentally time travel in order to uh, warn the Avengers beforehand or something to basically circumvent the snap. In, In some fashion like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might be, I might be misremembering certain bits, but that is, um, and she no. says something like, "There's something in the one of the one of the most recent trailers where they're all in those new suits, mm-hmm. and those look very close to the suits that, um, God, what's his name? Now I'm such, like, I'm such a huge Marvel fan that I've forgotten all the names. Um, Hank. Yeah, Hank was wearing it. Yeah, and Jan like was he wearing was it in like the quantum realm. Right. So like she she's under the impression that like there's some going to be some crazy quantum realm shit that goes on. I like it. I personally don't think that m- I wish they did, but I feel like um and it'll be a it'll be a pleasant surprise if they do something wild. But m- my personal opinion is that they're not going to do that. They're going to do something a little more tame, a little right. more like, you know, uh, Ant-Man finally, like, gets out of the quantum realm or whatever and goes fi- goes to find the Avengers because nothing makes sense. And that gets everybody to come together along with uh, Captain Marvel and all this stuff. And they basically go and find him and either basically beat the shit out of them and get the gauntlet back so that they can fix this shit or you know something something tame 
I was concerned that they they didn't have the edge in them to like do something wild and crazy. Sure. Um, I feel like there are certain movies that they play really close to, like they play very safely. Like they do the Marvel bits yeah. where it's like cool action scene, you know, a little bit of plot, cool action scene. Like there's like a formula to the madness and oh, some okay. movies don't follow that. Like I feel like the first Ant-Man doesn't follow it at all. Nope. But then like movies like Iron Man and like all of the introductory, like, superhero films do this like they they follow a certain formula that's very safe and it's very okay um i hope they don't do it with this one yeah uh so i i I actually would be really cool because i've always been a sucker for time travel so like anything time travel related would actually be fucking super dope that would be really cool so what about you what is your fan theory i have one big fan theory i don't tend to do fan theories but you know uh they're fun uh, and I think this is this is my big my big fan theory is that at some point in the film, Captain America is going to either lose or sacrifice the super soldier serum. And he's going to age quickly on screen using like CGI and stuff. Um, and it's basically going to take him out of commission of being a member of the Avengers at the end of it. And he's going to be able to retire happily as an old man because it hit me that Captain America's story arc is kind of just old man wants to retire and no one is letting him retire. But I think that uh, it's going to either be he's going to sacrifice it to save someone else or he's going to sacrifice it to do have something to do with the soul stone. Because remember how the soul stone you have to like sacrifice something that's incredibly important to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to it's going to have something to do with. It's going to be something he sacrifices at the 11th hour to turn the tide in the favor of the Avengers. And we're going to see him age up super quick. Maybe not necessarily die, but at the end, he, he will no longer be an Avenger. He will be he will be uh, incapable of, of doing super heroics at that point. So, yeah, that's my big one. I also feel like either either Captain America or Iron Man has to make like that big triumphant sacrifice. I would I would think it's probably going to be Iron Man because I was talking to a friend earlier about this today and his whole thing was, uh, have you ever seen The Wrath of Khan, the the Star Trek movie? Um, is this the one where what's his name dies and like the whole thing's like Khan? Yes. And then they yeah. do it as a they do a role reversal in one of the newer the newer ones Star Trek movies. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 And and so basically in in The Wrath of Khan. They established this test that you take at Starfleet called the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, which yeah, and it's is, supposed to be like the thing that's completely unwinnable, and like you're supposed like the lesson is like you have to deal with what you got. Exactly, and so you find out that Kirk was the only person to have all, always passed the was the only person who ever passed the Kobayashi Maru because he cheated. Ooh. And so, <laughs> uh, and so basically. <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> uh, so basically, um, Iron Man is similar in a lot of ways, right? Like, he doesn't like the no-win scenario. In fact, I think there's a line where it's like, what if you find a situation you can't win? He's like, I'll build something to make sure I can win. I'm misquoting, but I remember he's, I think he says that in Ultron at some point. Um, yeah, like, he's very, like, he doesn't believe in the rules, you know? Like, everything mm-hmm. can be, like, fudged with to some degree, and and as my one friend said, you know, it's like he's two weeks to away from retirement. He has a baby coming, yada, yada, yada. Like, Iron Man's probably going to bite the big one. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. I think in a family-friendly scenario, like, 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 I think from a story perspective, like, he should totally, like, sacrifice himself. But yeah. I think for the Marvel, like... Like, oh, I mean, this is still, like, this is, like, a family-friendly thing. Like, it'll be mm-hmm. Captain America because he's not really tethered to this, you know, to the cinematic universe in the same way that other characters are. Interesting. All right. So my money's on Iron Man. Your money's on Captain America. It looks like we found ourselves in a real civil war. Dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, I guess uh, next week... We'll be able to give some uh, initial reactions to it. Spoiler free, of course. 
Uh, can um, we though? Can we really? Well, I mean, I'm seeing it this weekend. I mean, I'm well, I'm gonna see it tomorrow. Like, it's gonna literally be recording, and then I'm gonna go see it. But I feel like we should wait a couple weeks before we give our okay opinion on it, just so that, that everyone gets a opportunity to see it. I was I was literally gonna say thumbs, but yeah, we can wait a couple weeks. But anyways, on to <laughs> uh, on to the history, right? Yeah, let's dump on it. Let's do. Oh. I'm sorry, that was bad. You dumped on it. I did dump on it. Yeah. So dumb. what lies are you telling me this week? This what lies are we talking about this week? Yeah. We're, we're talking we're talking about uh some some naval last stands. Ooh. Yeah. We're talking about ships, baby. I'm back mm. in my wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, hoist the mainsails and other things that yeah say, get your well, yacht music on and get your uh yeah and then there's like a concertina in the back it's like so anyways we're talking about the battle of myonyang um which occurred in 1597 um which was a conflict between the uh the joseon kingdom's navy of korea and this was a fight against the Japanese Navy um, that took place, as you might have guessed, in the Myongyang Strait near Jindo Island off the southeast, uh, southwest corner of um, the Korean Peninsula. Okay. So I knew exactly what you were saying the entire you? time. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, uh, spoilers again uh, for I might not pronounce things 100% perfectly. Um, but there was something about this story that I found super compelling and I wanted to talk about it this week. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the similarities between two countries, which is to say, uh, Great Britain and Japan. So what are some similarities between these two countries, Cody? Why? Uh, yes. <laughs> they're on the planet earth. They're on the planet earth. Well, they're both island nations. Right? Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and uh, islands don't tend to have a lot of um, res. Well, I mean, they have resources, right? But they don't have to have a huge amount of resources. Uh, and especially during time where, like, power was measured in things by, like, the amount of land you owned and things like that, uh, both of these countries wanted to expand. Um, so for Japan, the, the logical expansion was to go through Korea. Um, and so basically, uh, they decided that they were going to start a war against Korea. So, um, it's going to start off actually by, uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of political intrigue. Oh, snap. Yeah. Did you hear uh, that in the background? That was, that was your politics getting taken away in an ambulance. Yeah. Sorry about that. (laughs) I was, uh, it was, good call in the ambulance, but anyway, um, so there was a, a beloved admiral, uh, in the, um, J- Korean army named Admiral Yi Soon Sin. Um, and basically, uh, this guy was, like I said, he was beloved. He was well-respected. He was a wonderful military leader. And so Japan basically spent, sent, uh, spies into the uh, court of the Joseon dynasty. And they basically convinced the king of Korea that Admiral Yi was a traitor. So they impeached him and they almost put him to death. Um, Damn, but, that's rough. Yeah, right. But uh, I don't know. Someone intervened uh, and basically he was tortured for a little while. And then he was demoted to the rank of like about as low of a sailor as you can go. Uh, But to add insult to injury, um, they gave the command of the Joseon fleet to Yi's rival, a man named Won Gyoin, um, who was, by all accounts, an incompetent military leader, um, kind of a a person who was, it sounds like he was quite aggressive when he, you know, didn't necessarily use, like, Proper military strategy or things like that. Well, he was and all about the Zergling rush. He was all about the Zergling rush. Yeah, yeah. That's right. 
you know, you you know, you you, you gotta you can never underestimate the power of the Zergling Rush. Yes. Um, but basically, um, during uh Yi's command of the military, uh, they had grown the navy from sixty three warships to one hundred and sixty six warships, and then after his uh and rival took over, uh, basically the um navy was virtually wiped out um basically dropped down to 12 ships uh damn that's uh that's pretty uh that's a pretty poor effective way of using your zerglings i'm just saying yeah right and so and so basically um they they uh the korean people were starting to worry and panic because um during this this devastating battle um the the japanese fleet basically wasn't affected all that much um but one of the things that uh gratefully or one of the things that that happened that was good for korea was that admiral yi was um hastily reinstated as the commander of the navy because one Gwyn was killed during the battle that uh, did wipe out the majority of their navy, um, and so he had thirteen ships, um, and it's believed that uh, he started. You know, once again, uh, these things could be inflated a little bit for for various reasons, but it's believed that uh, he had only about a hundred men initially, uh, but over time he had built up a force of about. 1500 sailors by the end of september um and the king of korea at the time was worried that uh or he he basically was like you have 13 ships you have 12 or 13 ships um i think that you need to uh disband the navy and we basically uh, are not going to put up a fight anymore and uh at this point cody i want you to prep um you know like the that air horn that plays in you know it's all funny. We all love it so much because uh, this dude, Admiral Yi, responds with one of, in my opinion, the sickest quotes in in history. Um, it is uh, smoke no. weed every day. Yep. One hundred percent. You got yes! it. Yes. You got it. One hundred percent. No, yes. it was. Uh, uh, so this is a, a rough translation. Uh, but basically, the admiral sent a letter back to the king after the king told him to disband. Your servant still doth have 12 warships under his command, and he is still alive. The enemy shall never be safe in the West Sea. Damn. So he fucking, fucking fighting words. Yeah, he fucking threw down. Um, and basically, um, I, I, you know, hate to use use this idea uh but what he was able to do was he was able to effectively um use uh pirate strategies to uh win naval victories over much bigger and uh more powerful ships which is he took his um ships into the Meyer Yang Strait which was very narrow and very small and basically, he was able to even out the numbers because only one or two Japanese ships could come in at a time. Um, now, the strait also was incredibly strong. Uh, and basically, um, it like these currents were constantly shifting. So it was hard to get a feel for how it was going to affect your forces. And so basically... Um, because Admiral Yi knew these waters so well, he was able to use his knowledge of Japan's water, or rather of Korea, uh, of, of Korean's waterways to his advantage and was able to slowly over the course of, um, a few days, um, balance the powers. Um, and so about 30 ships crashed, um, into, you know, like either, uh, by being defeated during the military conflict. Uh, but by today's numbers, there's a pretty good estimate that more than 30 ships were destroyed. Uh, and at least half of the Japanese soldiers died or were wounded. 
um and uh basically um korea lost no ships damn yeah that was that was a crazy thing holy Uh, crap so he had he had two phases basically um that he would use um so when the current was flowing north uh basically the japanese fleet was spotted by yi um and they were able to um basically they dropped anchor and the uh the ships were basically the flagship alone was facing the enemy formation um and they were able to um basically hold out against the vanguard um now there are also people who there are some other theories um that there they might uh sorry uh there are some claims that perhaps ye had used like iron ropes or chains to tighten the channel between the japanese fleet which um basically uh like even further narrowed their army so basically he created an even smaller channel to his advantage uh which is some game of thrones level stuff um which actually if you only watch the show you wouldn't know this but uh yeah there was a the technique in game of thrones where they a army had a higher um number of ships and basically by using a large iron chain they were able to s- cut the numbers of ships in half but um this is i think uh one of uh, a a wonderful example of um a last stand used to um support and win so uh does this does this strike you as from similar to any other last stands we've learned about this season cody yeah this is like fucking 300 but if 300 worked it's like boat 300 yeah yeah Pirate no, it, 300 you know it's funny because we hear a lot about 300 yeah. probably mostly because of like the pop culture stuff but this one actually fucking worked and it was on boats like yeah this is easily something better to write about I know it sounds like a really cool story. Um, yeah. And so um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I I'm not too familiar with um, Korean like cinema or or you know television or things like that. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if if a Korean produced show or movie talked about this historic event, considering how important it was to their people. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Basically. Um, after after this fight um basically uh japan stopped its attack on korea and korea um and and basically uh once the 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 current began flowing south um Basically, the Japanese ships were unprepared that the current was going to change so quickly. And at that point, Admiral Yi decided that he was going to charge on the ships. And like I said, they damaged 30 of them. Um, and so uh, basically, um, like I said, this kind of stopped um, the the advance of... Um, the the japanese fleet into korea uh another thing too um in 1598 the chinese navy uh decided that they were going to join admiral yi um to help defend korea against japan um and so basically yeah um the this was kind of the end of this conquest against japan so or against korea rather uh so 13 ships were able to turn one of uh, Asia's largest naval forces against uh, away, uh, where it was able to protect themselves. So I thought that was a pretty cool story. So yeah, for real, that was dope. I mean, shit. Like I, I can't express this enough. This is what three hundred should have been. Should have been. Yeah. Yeah. I I have I, a question I, for you though. Yeah, of course. I'd love to hear it. So like, Japan lost a ton of units. Mm-hmm. Like, after they started lurs- l- lursing, losing their first, like, couple of ships, why didn't they just fucking go somewhere else? Or, like, go to... Is there is there only one way to get from 
Japan to Korea through um, these straits? Or was it just like, oh, the enemy's here, we might as well attack them? Because logically, if you lose your first two ships, like because of like the environment you don't engage in the environment yeah i i think it was a combination of um they just weren't familiar with how the the um str- the currents of the straits worked so the the commander of the japanese forces named todo takor takatora sorry uh basically described it as a whirlwind sea um okay so uh, basically, like I said, uh, the, sh- the, 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 t- the tides would, sh- or rather the currents would change every couple of hours and they were unpredictable in how, uh, or they were predictable enough, but they were unpredictable for people unfamiliar with them. And then it's just a matter of if you have a lot of ships in a small area, um, then, you know, it's kind of a domino effect in the worst possible way. Right. Sure. Um, but they could have also like 300 them. And like went around. Yeah, I wonder. I'm. I'm wondering. You know, I don't have a map of what it looked like in front of me. Uh, it could sure, have just sure. been. It could have just been that it was inaccessible from one direction, or okay. the way that they had situated their thirteen ships was just enough to protect them from this. Uh, all I know is that, like, like you said, this is some cinematic stuff, um, and and I I would love to see it get its due. So, hell yeah. And uh, with that being said, perhaps I think it's time we go into the middle section. Hey guys, welcome to the middle section where we tell you about all of the social medias that you can get in contact with us for. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was not w- awkwardly stated, right? <laughs> no, it was the most correct use of the English language. I mean, that's that's what podcasters do. Yeah. Language is like our swords. If we don't do a good job, then... So anyway... Oh, uh, God. He... If English was my sword, it would be this floppy, rusted-ass piece-of-shit sword. <laughs> Ooh, a floppy, rusted sword. Yeah, like, all yeah, it's good even... for is potentially giving you tetanus. I can't even imagine, like, what that would look like. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I don't know. I'm imagining, like, Ivy Sword, but, like, not in a cool way. Oh, that makes from sense. From Soul Calibur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so, like, it's, I, like, it's segmented like that, so it's, like, you know, I can, like, flick it around, but, like, it's also rusted and not usable, so it's, like, cool, I just have a floppy sword. I'll pick it up what you're putting down. So, anyway, uh, yeah. hey, if you want to if you want to draw pictures and show us what you think Cody's floppy, rusted sword looks like... Don't take that out of context. <laughs> I... That's why I added sword at the end, and I threw rusty in there, too. That doesn't... You don't think that helps? Not really. No. You think people are gonna <laughs> draw? You think people are gonna draw a rusty? Yeah. Uh, hey, w- th- we have a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> Send us fan art there. Oh God! At, you can uh, do so at fandom r underscore podcast. That is our Twitter handle. What a great handle! We yeah. Also post a hilarious images that cody's wonderful wife makes for us where yes take, where she takes the stupid shit we say and turns it into funny art somehow yeah did you see last week's with uh your hill to die on uh yes it was amazing <laughs> i'm gonna die on that hill it's yes be, it's gonna be me it's gonna be my own last stand also the wolf one was really good the wolf one was really good oh <sighs> anyways I was I was I was fond of uh, the rapper one. <laughs> <laughs> I always look at it. I'm like, oh man, that wasn't that was my dumb words, weren't they? Oh, such good such good words though. They're the goodest of the the gooderest of words. We have the best. We have we have the best words. Oof. Yeah. Oh, please so don't like, tell me that was your. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I. I sh- uh hey Cody, what if you wanted to get? In, what if I wanted to send you boys a lengthier thing? Two hundred fifty characters. That's not enough to express my rage. That's that fair. That's Joe's not enough to sp- express my rage. <laughs> uh, how could I do this thing? You could email us at fanroulettepodcast at gmail dot com. Oh, well, that was a great email that we got there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we all uh, please feel free to send us questions we love getting questions from you guys 
uh, that we can use to kind of uh, create conversations and spur conversations on um, in our in our episodes and things like that. Um, yeah, we love hearing from you. Write us some garbage kid fanfic, all that good stuff. But wait, Cody, I don't want you to have my email because you might sell that to the government. Okay, well, if that's the case, you can hit us up at www.fandomroulette.com where you can find... Yeah, we do have a website, and it's got a little bio of each of us so that people know a little more about us. That's cool. It's got all of our episode links. Nice. And then at the very bottom, right before the social media tags, there's a little area where you can put your name or your internet handle if you're feeling saucy. And a little subject and all the information you could ever potentially give us in a little box that doesn't ask for your email. Nice. Hey, Cody, uh, where else could I find your uh, your episodes of Phantom Roulette? Well, I don't know how you're listening to this one. That joke is still funny. <laughs> that's that's still that's still some A plus joke right there. <laughs> but we're uh, on iTunes. We're what? on SoundCloud Whoa. and Google Play what? and Spotify. Wow, that's a lot of places to be. It is a lot of places. And we're still growing. And we're still growing. Yeah, it's wonderful. And um, is there any other social medias that we forgot to mention? Yes, we have a Facebook account. We've got yeah. a an Instagram and a Tumblr account where yeah, all, yeah. Of our, all of our uh, social media posts go. So yeah, if yeah. you're more interested in those areas, because I totally get that, go everyone there. Has, everyone has their thing, right? It's true. And mine switches every like five years. I like, I like Instagram, uh, not to, you know, you know, derail us too, too much. I like Instagram because like, it's just, it usually is like nice pictures of dogs and that makes yeah, me happy. Yeah, yeah. That just, it cheers me up. Like, you go on to Twitter sometimes, it's like, oh boy, that's like a reasonable opinion that I agree with. And it's like, how come you're a Nazi? And then someone else is like, you're the Nazi for calling them the Nazi. I'm like, can we just stop talking about Nazis, please, for like two seconds? Nah, man, that's, that's the hip yeah. new thing to talk about, are Nazis. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that a sad state of affairs? Yeah. But anyway, Welcome. uh, yeah. Welcome back to World War Two, I guess. Yeah, weird, right? What you a know, wild I'm, ride. Yeah. That's why we're talking about fun fandom nerdy things, right? It's, it's to add, <laughs> yeah. It's to add a little bit of levity to to the good people's weeks. Yeah. Uh so yeah, uh hey. Uh also please rate, review, subscribe um on the iTunes. I don't actually know how Google Play's algorithms work, but if they have a similar thing, we'd love for you to do that there too. Uh, move us up those ranks. Please tell a friend. Um, if if you like us and you think there's someone out there who might enjoy this weird nonsense, then let them know. We'd love for uh, we love you know getting new friends and meeting new people and all that wonderful stuff. So, yeah, boy. And uh, on that, I think it's time that we go back to the content. So, <gasps> all right. So who did you bring into uh, the studio this week? Uh, yeah, who did I bring to the studio this week? It's a... Hey, th- hey there. Hello there, uh, man with deep voice. Yeah, guess guess which guess which mid two thousands protagonist I am. Oh God, there are too many. If I do good things, I get blue lightning. And if I do bad things, I get red lightning. Emperor Palpatine? I'm the protagonist <laughs> from Insidious, everyone's favorite video game. I don't I don't even remember that game. Or uh wait, no, it was um was Infamous? It, no, Infamous, yeah, that one. Oh yeah, I can't Insidious, remember that guy's name. Insidious was a sci fi movie that I think came out <laughs> around the same time, if memory serves. Yeah. I don't even remember the ding dang game name I'm in. So, uh, guy from Infamous, who I have unfortunately forgotten your name. It's Cole! Uh, yeah. What bring what brings you to the Phantom Roulette studio today? Well, I, uh, I, I was given a moral choice. Uh-huh. Which was, if I, if I appear on your podcast, 
then I get one point of blue lightning. But if I fry your whole system, I get 10,000 points of red lightning. So, oh, God. Oh, oh he's electrocuting me. Oh, Man, I'm oh. glad I'm off site today. Oh, no. Oh, oh God. Oh, God. <laughs> it hurts, Cody. It hurts. It's like a well, before you lightning. before you completely destroy our equipment and uh, my co-host, do you want to you want to hear me talk about video games? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What video games you talk about? I love video games. So today, well, this season we're talking play. about indie games. Like, games however, that take place in Indiana or? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that. <sighs> It's the worst. <laughs> it's it's so bad, and I love it so much. It's the no. dumbest joke, and I I don't know why it entertains me so much. But it's I don't know why it entertains you either. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Talk about your game. So today, <laughs> I'm talking about Return of the Obra Din. Ooh, that sounds like fun. What's that about? It is a game from, it's got a weird uh, company title, 3909 LLC, but it's a puzzle mystery game set in the early 1800s, where you are tasked with discovering what happened to the passengers and crew of the Obra Din for an insurance company. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a mystery puzzle game that tasks you to learn uh, who each member was on the ship and how they died, and if if they died, from what and by whom. Interesting. Uh, you're basically armed with the ship manifest, an elaborate drawing of the entire crew, and this cool watch called the Memento Mortem. <gasps> I've seen this game. Yeah, and What's the other big game they did. I don't know. Oh, I think they did one other big one. All right, let's keep going. Sorry. But um but the watch lets you re relive the last moments of that corpse's life. Dang. And over over the course of the game, you basically hop through bodies and watch these deaths and listen to what's going on and look at who's there involved in the situation and through very subtle clues in these visions, you are supposed to figure out who the people are, what their names are, and then how they died, if they died. Um, okay. And unfortunately, it's not a game where they're like, Frederick, no, don't die on me. They, they rarely reveal the names of people. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a lot of subtle clues, and you have to guess a lot. Um, however, there are enough context clues in the games, like, like the, the ship manifest basically gives you the person, their first and last name, and like, what like position they were, whether they were a passenger or a crew member. So occasionally you'll get like crew member titles. Um, there's also different, um, nationalities. Not everybody is from England or wherever this game, I, I think this game takes is off the coast of England, if memory serves. Okay. But, um, so sometimes you can get it based on, or you can take guesses based on the language that they're speaking. Um, basically the only way you get, I guess, progress is if you guess correctly three people's fates. Hmm. And so over the course of the game, you can use a process of elimination as you continue to get three you know, groups of three people to, you know, hone in on the, like, the last couple of people who are, uh, you know, harder to figure out. Um, if this sounds familiar, you're probably, you probably remember a game that came out last year that had a very, like, old Macintosh-style graphics, where it was, uh, it was two-toned, like, there were two colors, and they used a lot of uh, varying shades of these two, or not shades, but they used a lot of like basically line art to create this like 
three D effect with two colors. Um, it was it's very reminiscent of old Macintosh games. Yeah, but um, but yeah, that's Return of the Obra Din. It's um, if you're into mystery puzzle games, mm-hmm. this game is super. You know, it it hits all those mystery spots. Uh, it's fairly difficult. Uh, I think I just there are like this so while you're playing through the game it goes through basically this big story arc of like what happened on this ship as it was like sailing the seas and i think i have about 15 of the 60 people on the ship um but it's it's nuts it is a big game and uh i have a uh I guess it's a simple complaint. Okay. I don't know. This might be off-putting for some people. So, like, this is kind of a warning about this kind of game. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the pacing. Okay. Um, it starts off nice. Um, very quickly, like, you get your, you know, your manifest, your watch and all that. And you start going through these stories. And you're like, wow, this is really cool. And, like, this is definitely in the realm of, like you know, almost it it starts to get a little fantasy in this one and like, and like what's going on in the story. And it's like fucking cool. But the further and like the more scenes you watch, the harder it is to find all the scenes. And sometimes you just spend a lot of your time looking for a new scene because you have to, the the watch only works if you find a corpse. Hmm. But unfortunately most of the corpses have been moved post-mortem to somewhere else or off the ship. So the only way you can get access to certain things is to basically do this kind of like inception, like jump within a vision within a vision kind of thing. So like you'll go into a vision and there's like multiple people that died. Once that vision's done, you can go to the next body. Hmm. So when you're like in the overworld or... I guess it's an overworld's not the right, but when you're in like the main area, which is this ship, the game like kind of locks you out of certain areas. So like at first I can only go into like the captain's quarters and then the deck. And then after I've completed a couple of visions, it lets me go down to the next level. Okay. And then likewise, after that, the same thing, I'll, I, it unlocks the next part. And I'm like at the point now where like, it's, I'm scavenging. I'm literally just like, crawling through the same areas multiple times just to try to find a corpse or something dead so that I can move on. And the game doesn't give you any kind of like notes, whether you've unlocked new areas or not. So frustrating. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time just staring at the same fucking rooms. Like, I'm just like, no, that's where that one guy died. No, that's where that guy. Um, this game is definitely a slow burn. (laughs) And I mean, that's fine. It's a mystery game. I'm not expecting to beat it easily like that. That was never my complaint because that it could be that that is a possibility of what people would assume that I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is like, it's like a puzzle, but they only give you so many pieces at a time. Yeah. And a lot of times those puzzle pieces don't fit. So I need the rest of the game pieces. But the game gives me the game pieces at a slow pace to the point where, like, I can't solve the puzzle until I complete some, like, arbitrary, like, oh, there was a there was a skeleton foot in this one bathroom that I didn't look at because it's such a small room. I didn't bother to check it. Sure. And that's what's stopping me from getting the rest of the story. Because the that's story's true. dope. Yeah. It, it, uh, like, part of it has to do with, like, mermaids and shit. And then there's, like, ooh. some, like, there's, like, crazy, like crab monsters and shit like there's some cool stuff that happens in this game but like it's locked behind this kind of slow pace where i'm like sure i can't find all the bodies and i i was i was hoping that that part of it where, where like you get the visions was a little more streamlined and like the difficulty was trying to find like the context clues that you needed to guess the people so uh, uh I found it out by the way. I I was confusing. Uh the the gentleman who developed the game, Lucas Pope, also did Papers Please. So 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And like this game's great. And for for a single person to do this, like it's it's a fucking achievement because this game, like, there's a great yeah. story. I just think that there are some pacing issues where like I I was just wa- like I wasn't being tested on my ability to problem solve because it's basically a big logic puzzle i was being tested on my ability to spot like some arbitrary thing in a room that's like you know just basically for the lack of for a lack of a better term nonsense but if you're into mystery games and a slow burn is what you're looking for a game that'll like last you a little bit i think this one's a, a hit i think you'll enjoy it uh, so where can you find it? You can find it on the Steams. Whoa. Yeah, I think it's oh. PC only, although I'm probably wrong. Later me will tell me if I'm wrong. Nah, you good. <laughs> good, old, <laughs> good old later us. Yeah, I really enjoy later me. Yeah, sounds like a, sounds he, like a he does such guy. a good job at making sure I don't completely sound like a fool. Although, who knows? Maybe he does. Maybe he's secretly out to get me. Who knows? We yeah. never know about future us, right? It's very true. Very true. So, without further ado, oh. I know we usually do some crazy, crazy sniffs and stuff, but... Yeah, we're not going to do that this week. This week, we're just going to show you the garbage kid. What? A little... What's a garbage yeah, kid? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a section within a podcast where... Because we're big fucking nerds, we decided to create NPCs every week yeah. so that you can use them in your games or your stories or whatever you want to use them for. They're usually set in the they're well, they're all set in the fantasy world, and we use this cool book called Xanathar's Guide to Everything. It's a great book. It is a good book. It's the good book. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> There might be some people um, who disagree with our assessment. I'm anyway. sure there are tons of people who disagree with that. But anywho, this week, as I'm rubbing my hands together maniacally, we have... I'm so jazzed. Veil Queen Hunter. Ooh. The Dwarven Fighter. Nice. All right. Basic. Yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Veil knew who their parents were and was born in the headquarters of a secret organization. Rad. Vale is the oldest of three siblings and was raised by a single stepfather because their mother was taken away. Oh no. The queen hunters lived a modest lifestyle in a mansion. Okay. All right. Yeah. So like a little, new, like a little, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> vale had a genteel poverty. There you go. There you go. Vale had a few close friends and lived an ordinary childhood. Cool. Vale became a fighter because they grew up fighting, refining their talents by defending themselves from anyone who crossed them. Oh, shit. Okay. The Queen Hunter's herald... herald, Wow, I can talk. Heraldic sign is two crossed greatswords in front of a castle signifying the defense of a kingdom. Their instructor was a tribal warrior whose everyday life was about fighting. Interesting. Vale's signature fighting style is energetic. They sing and laugh during combat as their spirit roars. They are the happiest when there's a foe in front of them and a weapon in hand. Good old boisterous bruiser. So, that being said, Vale is 55 years old. And I'm really mad because they only have two events leading up to this very moment. Really? Again? Yeah, I rolled... I almost rolled in a hundred on this character for their age, and then I rolled a fucking two for the events. I was really, I was really frustrated. That's so that is frustrating. That being said, Vale would gain a bit of good fortune, a riding horse to call their own. Oh, that's fun! And then finally, they would spend a time working the fields for a bit of money. <laughs> that one's not so much fun. Yeah. So. Through our patent pending two twenty twenty system, yeah. Would Vale Queen Hunter go into a hot topic, hmm. and would they buy something? Hmm. Hmm. 
I'm going to say no. I feel like because of their happiness and enthusiasm on the battlefield, they would like kind of see it as a sad place and be like, I don't feel like going in there. (laughs) I'm going to go down to the FYE. Ooh, you think they're an FYE fan? Okay, okay. So you get similar Um, things, but like also it's brighter in there. You know, I'm going to say they do go in, but the only time they buy is when there's like some fucking metal ass shit, like some like Metallica or whatever. Yeah, I feel it. They never get into like the Sum 41 blankets and uh, the, uh, the, oh my God, we're so old, Cody. I know. I'm starting to forget all the, the, the modest mouse wristbands. The Modest Mouse wristbands. Yeah. That was Fair a band. Enough. Modest Mouse. It was about... You're you're not wrong. The, <laughs> Fran, the Franz Ferdinand's... Uh, the the Avril Lavigne's is... Yeah, things. or Pink. Do you know that... You know uh, the song Skater Boy? Yes. She uses, she uses an She eight? said, see you later, boy. Yeah, well, she uses an eight... Because that sounds like the word, like, because if you spell out skater boy, but with an eight, it it makes the sound. So anyway, uh, uh, oh my gosh, Cody, it's a dragon. Oh! That was, that was to see if you were on your toes. I know. It almost, it almost breathes fire all over me. But luckily or I was... multiple other kinds of <gasps> breath weapons. <gasps> What are we talking about this week, Cody? Well, you spoiled that one. It's dragons. Were you, you going to do a bit? I'm sorry if you're going to do a bit. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm just giving sorry. you our time. That's no, cool. All right. So, yeah, um, we were decided that it was time to talk about the titular monster in the game Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Which is Dagrons. Now, here's, yeah. the, now here's the thing about dragons is uh, dragons are crazy complex but don't worry about it they're like very cool so um there are two kind of major um would you say schools of dragons how would you describe rate two major distinctions of dragons are we talking about like the gygaxian dragons or dragons overall dragons overall how we're well, talking so about- that's the thing, right? Is like dragons come in so from so many different like historical regions of the world. It's true. Like, and and they all have different like forms and representations. Mm-hmm. Like, like the uh, long, like almost snake like dragons that like you can that is uh, very reminiscent of uh, Shenron and Dragon Ball Z. Yep, if memory serves. So yes, or like you know you've got your um, your traditional, well, I don't know if tra- uh, have, traditional uh, medieval, I guess, yeah. is the right word I was looking for. Like medieval, the medieval dragons of like Skyrim, which are like, what if dinosaurs had wings on them? Yeah, and they were just like, "Fuck that! I'm gonna breathe fire all over your village." Yep. Um, you have some things in in like um, Mesoamerican and native cultures that are yeah. dragon esque. Mm -hmm, Um, without mm -hmm. necessarily having the term dragon associated with them. Yeah. Um, And I I think one of the really kind of interesting things, uh, if I can can do history for just a a hot second. um, Hell yeah. Maybe it's something we could talk about in future episodes. Um, The the dragons of Eastern cultures tended to be uh, kind, whimsical, uh, and very much like protecting, whereas dragons in Western culture tended to be angry, um mean hoarding and things like that um so i think it's really well yeah didn't you know that those europeans didn't like uh things that were different from them that's fair (laughs) but uh yeah um so yeah like one of the earliest dragons to show up in like western mythology is uh apollo kills a dragon uh who was like hoarding gold and stuff whereas um the like the three main rivers in China uh, are the bodies of three dragons who sacrificed themselves to give the people of China water. Like hell yeah, it's a it's quite a it's quite a distinction, right? 
Yeah. Um, and it's just something I think is really fascinating, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, then fast forward and like countless pop culture references later. Sure. You have gotta... you have Dungeons and Dragons who uses uh, the very medieval version yeah. of dragons being these kind of greedy evil creatures at least in the very early editions i mean back in the early editions there was what shit there was like four alignment tiers like you could either be yeah like there were like four forces there was like good and evil fighting Mm -hmm. and then there was like or this isn't first edition but anyways point being like D and D over over the years simple. has changed quite a bit, and like dragons back at you know in in ye olden days of D and D were just you know very like you are this kind of dragon, you are evil, you breathe fire. You're this kind of dragon, you you're 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 still a dick, but you breathe electric. Well, and and it kind of you know I I think you've said this before for sure. It kind of harkens back to the fact that this was initially a war game, right? Where, true true well you know, and the very like concept of D like back in the day it was mostly like the adventures or like the the concept like wasn't as like in depth as it was today like a lot of the books were like you know a lot of the fun was going to a crazy dungeon mm-hmm. getting your ass kicked in said dungeon yep. and then figuring out how you're going to collect like all the millions of gold that you found and drag it back to town so you could like buy a castle or whatever yep and what what better to put at the end of a very long scary dungeon than a big old nasty dragon yeah and and what's nice is over the course of the editions uh i think wizards of the coast and in you know and even back to the you know gygaxian days they kind of began to rethink dragons. Like I, I believe in third or three point five is where they came with or where they started to classify dragons and kind of dragon like creatures under the same umbrella. Yep. They also had like metallic dragons, which were often the kind of good counterpart to the evil chromatic dragons. Yeah, the benevolent ones. Right. And they even had some, uh, and some like, like they had gem dragons, which were like psionic dragons, which sounds fucking rad. Ooh. But, um, there's so many different mythos behind dragons. Yeah. And I think what's great about modern day D and D, like, you know, the age of, you know, uh, content, like out the ears with D and D, like you don't have to stick to the, traditional because yeah. i mean like going back to you know the the D D dragons they're mostly considered evil and greedy and have a bunch of like treasure hordes like but what about creatures or dragons like falcor or yeah. or mushu for that matter mm-hmm. mushu might have been a little greedy like he was really at the beginning of that kind of doing it for his own thing but like he was well spirited for respect yeah yeah but um but either way like you have these varying different dragons and the one thing that i wanted to say about dragons is change it up yeah it's kind of like my thing with these monsters uh because like don't get me wrong if you need a dragon to like fucking fuck shit up like the the monster manual has got you covered there are varying degrees of dragons there are Kind of like dragon kin or like cousins to dragons, like wyverns and dragon turtles. And like you even have some like half dragons, like some humanoid esque creatures. Players can play dragonborn, which kobolds. are. Yeah, kobolds are another good example. There's like supposedly distant relatives to dragons. But I implore you to change it up. Yeah. If you've got people who've been playing, change it up. In my current campaign uh dragons are in hiding oh uh dragons are too afraid to like show their might and so they kind of work as uh they work in humanoid fashion to you know take what they want through that matter you know through uh you know political intrigue or you know businesses and things like that um 
in my game, and this is very different from D from the D&D stat block, is that they are similar to Maleficent, in which they have a human form and a dragon form. Yeah, I've experienced that in a couple of games, actually, and I love it every time. Yeah, I mean, uh, World of War or Warcraft and World of Warcraft did the same thing. They, you know, all their dragons can turn into kind of a humanoid form. Yep. Um, but basically... You know, I'm here to say that change change your shit. You know, it's okay if uh, you got a red dragon that's more like Falcor and is like a wise old dragon that helps out your party, or maybe dragons are you know, you know maybe maybe dragons just hide among the people and there's like an entire civilization of them that they just kind of like, you know. They don't want to create trouble no more because they got into a big fight that they lost and they want to, like, you know, just kind of live. Maybe dragons are benevolent rulers who actively are making the people's lives better. Yeah. By sharing their wealth and their riches over, you know, that they've acquired over time. Exactly. But yeah, I think dragons are super fun. Um, they're real tough. Uh, oh, you don't so want to throw... <laughs> yeah, you don't want to throw them at a low level or an inexperienced party. Um, cause they usually have, uh, fairly good resistance to most mundane attacks yep. and their breath weapon is usually a mess. It's kind of the, in my opinion, it's, it's often the first time a party has to go, yeah, we should probably not stick together. <laughs> like we should probably fan out in like 10, 10, 20 feet, like increments as to avoid getting blasted all by the same fire breath yeah uh i'll say this too uh this is something i didn't know until i started looking through the monster manual uh i think it's really cool that they describe what uh different dragons layers look like or rather oh yeah dragons so if you are going for a classic you know um a, a classic big scary lizard boy at the end of a big scary dungeon you know things like uh Black dragons, I think, like, what, live in swamps, right? Something like that. Yeah, they live in swamps, and their layers, like, emit swamp-like features as to, like, you know, their will is affecting the land around them, which I think is fucking dope. I think it's really cool as well. But yeah, I mean, you know, as Cody was saying, uh, I think, you know, having, having you know, the whole switching between human and, or a human form and a dragon form also adds, like, a little bit of a... Uh, a level of fun as well because uh you know um from uh you know from our own personal experience you know uh we had saved a a a dragon who landed and then turned into a human and it like freaked half the party out it was so much fun but <laughs> yeah yeah well and also yeah. like it's such it's a it's a fun challenge yes. um i've always been i always loved playing around with dragons because like Cause I'm so like, as a kid, like dragons were like the big, scary, bad guy at the back of, you know, the back of a dungeon. And I'm oh, like, the coolest. yeah. And now that I'm, you know, g getting on into my thirties, it's like, okay, cool. Like that's, that's fun to do. And that's, that can be a fun aside in a, in a game. But like in my last campaign, dragons lived in their own, uh, fucking super city that floated in the sky. Yeah. And they had made a pact to basically, like, we don't fuck with you, you don't fuck with us, and we'll just kind of leave it, you know, leave each other alone. They weren't evil dicks at all. Nah, well, no, most... The council was kind of dickish, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, then, yeah, that's once again uh, something that we've been harping on as well, where it's, you know, there were good dragons and there were evil dragons, and there were yeah. dragons who made less than moral decisions... For, you know, the first, maybe a small benefit in the short term, uh, not looking at the bigger picture, looking at the long term, things like that. Um, yeah, well, and then the the, the dragon that in the, on our earlier campaign, and this is spoilers for whenever we decide to do a campaign diary of the six. Yeah. Um, their main Their main objective through the whole game was to find this particular dragon who was like an asshole and fucked shit up. Mm -hmm. But really... They were being manipulated by another dragon who was like, yeah, that guy's a dick. You should kill him. And secretly, that person that they were with was, in fact, the dickle. The dick. <sighs> still yeah. Bad. Still bad. 
But anyway. I mean, you, you still mad about that? No, it was amazing. It was, <laughs> I, I literally... I, that was a great reveal. That was after we had gone to, to uh, every other week sessions. And, like, I literally sat there. Uh, no, we had... Yeah, we were still in there. But I literally sat in my house for, like, two weeks just, like, thrilled and fuming and excited <laughs> and curious and confused and, like trying to think of like when I could have realized it earlier, all of these different things. It was a, it was a lot of fun from a player perspective, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, dragons, they're classic. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I personally feel like if there's not a dragon, at least a little bit, I am not going to be quite as happy with the campaign overall. <laughs> you know, I mean, to be fair, it is called dungeons, dungeons and dragons. dragons. I yeah. feel like if you're not in a dungeon at some point mm-hmm. and you're not fighting a dragon, I think something is off. Which also riddles. We got riddles. Oh yeah, yeah, like, yeah we got we get there's some riddles. I'm so excited. But anyways, oh <laughs> uh, yeah, dragons, they're classic, they're wonderful. Uh throw them into your game, see what happens. Um, yeah. Do you wanna do you wanna wrap her up? Yo. Alright, thank you guys so much for listening to Phantom Roulette. Please go back to the middle section to learn about our social media. And also, please yeah. rate, review, subscribe, tell a friend, all of these wonderful things. Uh, we are, yeah, we love doing the whole growing thing, and uh, we love sharing our, our, our passion and our information with you. Uh, and if you let a friend know, that makes it that much easier. So, um, Hell yeah. And uh, signing off for Phantom Roulette, this is Joe. And I'm Cody. And as always, stay nerdy. Stay super nerdy.